Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, or whoever, some of the greats. You can always stand outside and then experience what is happening within the framework of the novel, which the fiction. And you can always keep this aesthetic distance between yourself and the world. But when it came to King Lear, I absolutely failed to keep this aesthetic distance between myself and the world. I would get sucked right into the maelstrom of raging emotions. And it's very difficult for me to really feel where I am standing, and to my great surprise, and to my great dismay, I should say, as a teacher, I have always been asked to teach King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I did King Lear in Delhi for one year, and then I came down to Warangal. And Warangal, when I came there, in the 80s and early 90s, there was the entire city of Warangal was undergoing a very revolutionary movement. You must have heard about it, the Naxal movement. Three fourths of my students were Naxals, with varying degrees of Naxalism, of course, in their dream. And uh, one fourth were, of course, the girl students. I always wonder, how am I going to teach Shakespeare to these natural kids? You know, I was very apprehensive about that. <coughs> and somehow I was always asked by the head of the department that I should teach King Lear. Even though during those days, you know, I looked fairly young, but still, in anticipation of my old age, they would always ask me, no, sir, no, Sharmaji, you should do King Lear. So I am stuck. I was actually stuck. And to my great surprise, or rather, not certainly surprise, but dismay, I should say, I was never able to do the last line of King Lear. You know, the girl students, their eyes would go moist. Even my eyes would go moist. And I would look at the Nazal students. They were all, and I still remember, I think I should say this actually, that one important incident. Right in, in the front row, there used to be one uh, his name is Sheshgir Law. This Sheshgir Law, a wily, very, very tall, and supposed to be very violent, very violent person, because he was a Nazarite, and he was also a, a kind of an ideologue. There was another person, I think Shamra, Shamra was also an ideologue, and he used to he used to hold this um, indoctrination classes uh, for other students in the sprawling university campus. And there was the, the famous uh, folk singer who would sing until one day. Now, I am actually recollecting all these episodes for one simple reason. This was the kind of a milieu in which I had to operate and I had to teach King Lear. So that's the kind of a milieu. And <coughs> there was another reason also. My colleagues were one more wrong. Most of you must have had <laughs> but were wrong. And another, yeah, and another person was uh, Hargopal. You know, Hargopal, recently he mediated on behalf of the government of India to get an IAS officer released from the clutches of the Nazarites. 
So Hargopal is a very good friend of mine, actually. We used to have a lot of discussions, especially on the role of violence in the revolutionary change, how social media can actually um, sort of theorize violence in order to see that it has a certain instrumental value in bringing about uh, radical changes in society. And all these things, actually, I used to undergo all these discussions. And in that kind of a milieu, teaching Shakespeare and also King Lear, I had my own apprehensions. But to my great surprise, the play went down extremely well with my Nagzal students. And especially when I moved on to Act 3, when King Lear divested of all his imperial authority and being reduced to the very thing itself, unaccommodated man, a biped, a pork animal. Well, you know, my students could react, respond so nicely because for them, a tyrant is someone who is actually brought down to his knees. So, to my great surprise, I found that especially the Naxal students, they were all very much interested in my comments, very much interested in how the play actually moved on from the first act to the third act. The third act actually went down extremely well with my students. Now, having said this, <coughs> I may have to now ask for some kind of a significance. What kind of significance is there in this unrelieved gloom of a play where an old man, an imperial, a man with an imperial authority, suddenly being rejected by ungrateful daughters. And uh, here I think I remember Harold Bloom's statement that King Lear is an encyclopedia of um, egotism, desire, and self-assertion. You have all these things. You, are, you have egotism, enormous ego of King Lear. And then there is the desire that you should be loved by one and all. And finally, of course, you have this self-assertion suddenly giving way to a very high kind of skepticism, asking very fundamental questions. What am I? This great man with enormous ego suddenly finds himself under the stormy night. What am I? And you can see here Shakespeare reaching the very heights, the metaphorical heights, because you can see it here, on the stormy night, with uh, old man and the fool, both of them being rejected by the social world. They find themselves in the world of nature, and then, what is it that finally gives them a kind of a new consciousness. Now that is something which I really wanted to find out actually. What kind of significance is there? Is there some kind of a significance actually in Shakespeare's making these old men go through severe ordeals? Is there something in the philosophical framework of the continental philosophy. Because, you know, Shakespeare was extremely sensitive, not only that, very, very acute in his awareness of what, is, what was happening around him. <coughs> now, before I actually get into a philosophical framework, which I'm sure is working at the back of the play, King Lear, uh, I would like to draw your attention 
to one important word. Yesterday, for instance, Dr. Charlie was actually referring to how we have got to attend to the actual words used in Shakespeare. You know, it so happens the moment we start teaching Shakespeare, we, we try to concentrate on the characters, we forget the language, we forget the kind of metaphorical strength that actually is sustaining all the characters. We forget that. We get actually trapped into the characterization. But I had a feeling, especially in King Lear, because I was actually looking for a kind of a thematic center, a signature term, a trope, if you will, which can control all the structural elements in the play. What is that one? Now here, I want to draw your attention to the very first explosive scene. The very first explosive scene in King Lear. Now, <coughs> the first two daughters have already expressed how much they love their old father. And uh, of course, the old man was very much satisfied. But he has a special kind of affection for Cordelia. So he calls out Cordelia. Now speak, my joy. <coughs> Nothing, my lord. Now all of a sudden, the transition is so abrupt from the formalized speeches of great affection being shown to the old man by the first two daughters. Here is a sudden transition of something which is, which I think the old man is not able to understand. Because he is so used to flattery that all of a sudden, here is Cordelia, the most favorite daughter, he is saying, Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come out. Nothing. Speak again. And Cordelia says, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. Now, there seems to be a very special kind of significance <coughs> of the word nothing. You all remember, of course, the great soliloquy by Macbeth. For, for, for instance, that is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So, in the Shakespearean vocabulary, nothing has a special kind of significance. And Shakespeare is very quick to emphasize a certain philosophical significance of the word nothing, because at the end of Act 1, Scene 4, that's a very, very suggestive kind of a scene, because there, for the first time, Lear has come face to face with his own self, which is already fragmented. And then there's a sudden reiteration of the term nothing. Now, why is it Shakespeare is emphasizing so much on nothing? I will answer that question in a twice. Now, the old man is sitting completely dejected because already has been rejected by Goneril, the first daughter. And Goneril always appears before him frowning, full of frowns. So, fool, the fool says, can you make no use of nothing, uncle? Why, no, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. Then fool says, you were once a pretty fellow when you didn't have to care for a frowning. Now thou art an O, a big zero, <coughs> without a figure. I am better than thou or now. I am a fool, thou art nothing. See the kind of emphasis that this word actually gets 
from the Shakespearean vocabulary. I was thinking about this actually um, within the framework of the uh, this not so uh, environment that I had to face actually. Then I suddenly thought, maybe at the back of the play, there is the well-known negative theology of the Christian tradition of the 4th and the 5th century, when you have the Christian thinkers like Dionysius and afterwards St. Augustine and Meister Eckhart, all these people, they believed in a kind of negative theology. Now what is this negative theology of the Christian uh, philosophy? They all said, and of course, uh, it was uh, Dionysius who said, <coughs> God is absolute nothing. See, how that term, uh, that nothing actually gets its uh, reinforcement of meanings, actually. God is absolutely nothing. He is beyond all existence. And you have, in the 16th century, I'm sure Shakespeare must have been fully aware of these philosophical notions of negative theology. And then in the 16th century, it was Saint John of the Cross in Spain, who writes a long poem in Spanish, and he calls it The Dark Night of the Soul. And it gets instant success in the entire continent. I'm sure Shakespeare must have been absolutely fully aware of the significance of the, you know, the dark night of the soul. And in the dark night of the soul, uh, The dark night of the soul, it comes in two phases. The first phase deals with the purification of the senses. And the second phase, it deals with the purification of the soul. Now, you just insert the play King Lear within the framework of this the negative theology and the dark night of the soul. Because what you find in the entire play, until the last few scenes, it is the dark night of the soul that King Lear undergoes. And then, when I would come to the final scenes, of course in the classroom, it was extremely difficult for me to disengage myself from what was happening. Especially if you throw in a bit of history or it's when you're actually teaching Shakespeare, you get so much involved. As I said, in fact, it's very difficult to maintain the kind of aesthetic distance that is very important for a critic when you want to evaluate your work of art. But I failed completely. And my students, with a kind of revolution, revolutionary theory simmering in their brain, they would all rivet their eyes on me. Look at this man, he's a bourgeois liberal. <laughs> and he doesn't understand the value of violence in the revolutionary changes required in a society. But they were extremely similar to me. Uh, you know, this bourgeois is actually not able to read the last scene because his eyes actually are going moist and very soon he will just break down. And even to this day, whenever I run into one of my old students of Warren, he says, Sir, you could never read the last scene of King Lear. <laughs> you know, so you can see, for instance, <coughs> the kind of contradiction 
or the kind of contrast that I had to face actually when I was actually teaching Shakespeare to a class of Nagzaru students actually. But they could suddenly get into the spirit of it. This is something, you know, which has uh, really appealed to me. Now, the final scenes, I must really make these last comments. Now, there is the final moment of cognition for King Lear, because, you know, he, he goes mad, he goes uh, uh, completely bereft of any kind of uh, uh, optimism that he can think of. Actually, as I said, in, as I said uh, he was an unaccommodated man, actually, a biped, a forked animal, and uh, all of a sudden, this is once again, you know, the Christian framework, this is what I'm actually emphasizing. Because the universe of Lear is actually a pagan world. Because, you know, as I said, as Christ the wanton boys of it to the gods, they kill us for their sport. You know, that is the kind of universe that King Lear actually inhabits. Now, you can see, for instance, Shakespeare, a Christian after all, he has to present a pagan world to a Christian audience. So you can see how there are these two different kinds of frameworks being superimposed. With the result, the last few scenes that you find in King Lear are the scenes of reconciliation, a kind of 